And at this conference, I think we've always strived to get a wide variety of very high quality speakers, but not always the ones that uh, we would find at community not-for-profit type of conferences. And our first speaker today, I think, fits very well into that category. Uh, in fact, Professor Ian is known for his business and economic acumen, but the work he does has profound effects on us all as consumers, as members of organisations and on our clients. And you may know of Ian from his time at the inaug as the inaugural chair of the Australian Fair Pay Commission. And you may also know that recently he was, just a few weeks ago in fact, he was appointed to the Reserve Bank of Australia. Ian's other roles included uh, senior positions with Deloitte and at Melbourne Business School and chairing the recent competition policy review, which was a real root and branch review of all of Australia's competition policy laws and regulators. What you may not know, though, is that Ian is also very committed to the community sector, and our, our very own Dennis had experience of that recently when he was looking for some help with some complex economic analysis for a homeless service that he chairs. And Ian provided a number of very enthusiastic Deloitte staff to help Dennis out with that work. And it's been greatly valued and had a terrific effect on that homeless service. So we are very honoured to have Ian here today, turning his mind to the interaction between economics and our community. Please make Ian very welcome. Well, thank you, Father Joe, for that warm introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I, I might not be the sort of person you normally hear from, but I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to Dennis in particular, but also to Maureen and Kathy for making me very welcome here. Can I start by saying thank you for the work that you do in community? Uh, as economists, we're often accused of, um, you know, the old Oscar Wilde line about cynics knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing. Well, this particular economist does understand the value of community work. And I want to say thank you for all the people here and all the work that you do right across the different dimensions of Australian community. Uh, you might think that it's not valued by those who are engaged in other aspects of work uh, trying to drive our prosperity more broadly. Uh, but at least if I speak on behalf of myself, uh, I can say that I don't underestimate that value at all. So thank you. Uh, and that was why I was very happy to um, accept Dennis's invitation to come and speak this morning about place. I'm not talking about the Reserve Bank, least of all at this stage, uh, but not talking about competition policy or those other different things I've had the privilege of being involved in. Today I want to talk about this piece of work uh, that is in a series that Deloitte Access Economics calls Building the Lucky Country. Uh, we have a series of um, so-called thought leadership papers that look at different aspects of our prosperity more broadly. And this one is number five. If you're interested in following this up, uh, you simply go on to the web and type in building the lucky country, all one word, buildingthelucky.country.com.au, and it will bring up this report. There's an accompanying video. There are some interviews and some other bits and pieces that you might be interested in. And there are also uh, the previous four reports you can access there as well that deal with different aspects of Australia's economic development broadly conceived. Uh, this one is about place. Uh, and we thought that we needed to write about place, in fact, to reconsider the purpose of place, not because the idea itself is new. Uh, and if I may say so, the importance of place is not a message which communities really need to hear. Uh, communities get the idea of place. Governments get the idea of place. And individuals, as individuals, of course, we understand implicitly the importance of place. Where we were born, where we grew up, where our parents are buried, where we may want to be buried. Place is a very deep and significant thing for us as individuals. It's business that often thinks of itself as footloose and fancy free, and therefore not tied to place. This particular series, is addressed to business. The subtitle, the main title is Building the Lucky Country. The subtitle is Business Imperatives for a Prosperous Australia. Business Imperatives. So I said to Dennis that what I, I want to do this morning is, as it were, to invite you 
to be listeners in to a conversation which Deloitte Access Economics is having with business. So you're the flies on the wall. Many of the things that I will say in this presentation, you will find sort of obvious in a way, and you think, well, well, yes, you know, why get someone to come and tell us these things? This is, this is our life. Yeah, well, fine, I understand that. I want you to be eavesdroppers, to be listeners in on this conversation, because it may give you another angle on how to talk to the business community about the sorts of imperatives that drive you. And rather than have their eyes glaze over, I'm being a little bit black and white here, obviously it's not true of every business person, but eyes glazing over and thinking, oh, well, yes, you know, another good cause, there are lots of good causes and stuff, that you can say, hey, whoa, 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 there's another way to think about this. You can think about this as part of good business. So, yes, I'm not saying, you know, you wouldn't be moved by concerns to do with community or bleeding heart type arguments. I mean, anybody, of course, at some level is moved by those. But even if you want to be the hard-nosed business person, then here is a set of arguments which ought to make you sit up and take notice about the purpose of place. So that's the agenda. If you're thinking, well, why is this character coming along and talking to us about place? You know, we're community organisations. We get this idea. Uh, Ho-hum. I'm saying to you, be an eavesdropper to a conversation that we are having with business about this. And then you might want to still come along and say, oh, well, you've left out this bit, you've left out that bit, or you can emphasize, that's all good. I'm happy to have that feedback. But the main aim of this is to get into the normal economics-type conversation that we're having with business. And yes, I will talk about things like productivity, right? Yes, I'll talk about that. That's the language of business. Those are the things that get the attention of business and policymakers. And we wanted to inject place into that conversation. That's where this presentation comes from. OK? That's where it comes from. Very happy to have feedback, either directly over coffee this morning, or you can send me an email later on if you like. I'm on the web, just at Deloitte, iaharper at deloitte.com.au. Or you can take a look at what's on the internet the address I just gave you, and you can respond that way if you'd like to give us some feedback. Uh, but once more, just with feeling, the presentation isn't intended for you directly. It's intended for another party, in part about the sorts of things that drive you. That's where it's come from. OK. So, place matters for our prosperity. Now, it matters for our prosperity more broadly conceived, for the reasons I've just given you, but it also matters quite narrowly for our economic prosperity, for our productivity. Now, place has always mattered for that. Uh, that is why in this country, for example, uh, the Europeans settled on the coast. Uh, they settled on the coast because they could get access to the sea. Eventually, of course, they moved a bit inland and started to grow things. But the links between Australia and uh, Britain in the first instance, and then Europe and other parts of the world, sea, sea trade, and then ultimately, of course, transport by air. Location matters for economic activity. You need to be close to resources that are productive. Close, as I said, to ways of transporting those resources. Place matters. If you're miles away from anywhere, disconnected, no local resources of any note, then you'll find that those places don't prosper. So it's not true, particularly in the internet age, when people thought or conjectured that finally place and distance would be rendered irrelevant, that it wouldn't matter where you were. You're as connected to the rest of the world on some remote desert island as you are in the middle of downtown Manhattan. Therefore, uh, we don't expect place to be relevant anymore. Th that might sound nice and sound logical, but, but experience has put the lie to that view. At the same time that we've become more digitally connected to one another on this planet than ever was true uh, in human history, at the same time that that has occurred, we've become more urbanised, not just here in Australia, but around the world. Cities are growing more rapidly than they've ever grown. We have become more concentrated notwithstanding the fact that technology allows us to live anywhere. We are choosing to live closer and closer to one another in larger and larger agglomerations. Why is that? 
place matters for our prosperity. It always has, and it matters now even more. So it always mattered, even for our indigenous forebears, people who first came to this country, place mattered. They were nomadic peoples, but where they roamed, the places they went, that was just not random. They went for hunting grounds, for fishing grounds, and yes, of course, also for ceremony and for community, but different places had sacred significance for them, in addition to significance for being, uh, fulfilling their lives in a material sense. We invented settled agriculture. Uh, settled agriculture also is driven by place. Some places are more productive, more agriculturally productive than others. And then we got to the industrial economy after the Industrial Revolution. Again, place mattered. This time it mattered for where you could get your power sources from. So the great factories, those dark satanic mills of the Industrial Age. No coincidence that they were located near coal fields or near rivers for water supply and for water power or near exposed areas where you could drive windmills. Place mattered. We've moved on from the industrial economy rapidly into the knowledge economy. Uh, in Australia, for example, it's as you can see from this chart without even needing to read the legend, just look at the bars. Those tall bars show you uh, the proportion of Australians who are now engaged in the services sector, broadly speaking, in the knowledge economy. Roughly 80% of all of Australia's output, 80% of all of jobs, are in the services sector. We are seeing the emergence rapidly of the knowledge economy. And do these service jobs, do they amount to, as it were, as they say, taking one another's washing in? No, that's not true. Yes, there are service jobs, of course, that are relatively menial in the same way that there are industrial jobs that were relatively menial. But the growth of value of services jobs is linked to the input of knowledge and creativity and innovation. Those things make services jobs extremely productive and highly valuable. And this is the reason, essentially, that we are, notwithstanding the internet and the potential of digital technology, this is why we are living closer together. This is why cities are growing and getting larger. Why people are not taking the opportunity to live, as it were, miles away from everybody else and just connect in from time to time. No, they want to live close together and work close together. Why? Because that is where the stimulus comes from. But from a, a material perspective, that's what drives economic output. I can't show you a chart here today, mainly because it was developed by one of our competitors. <laughs> uh, but there is a very good chart prepared by... Let me say it, let me spit it out, right, by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, they have a lovely chart that shows the distribution across Australia's geography of um, GDP, of output production. So you just sort of map of Australia and then vertically rising up, it's a 3D chart, bars showing you how much output, what the contribution to national output is of those different places. Now, if you drew that chart uh, in the 19th century, you know that most of the productivity, most of the output would be produced by rural Australia. The three great industries that built the prosperity, the material prosperity of this country of ours. Wool, starting in the 1840s. Gold and related minerals, starting in the 1850s with the discovery of gold by Edward Hargraves in 1851. And then wheat and grain and more broadly the pastoral industries in the latter part of the 19th century. Now, all of those industries are land intensive, and they are all distributed around the country. So you would see that proportion of output, you know, very evenly distributed right across at least, not the very centre and the desert parts of our country, but those parts that were able to be mined or farmed, uh, that's where the productivity would come from. And the cities were there, but the cities were essentially administrative centres. Moving into the 19th century, you start to see the transition towards the industrial economy, and it's the outskirts of cities where the, and, the, and the industrial cities themselves, like Port Kembla, Wyala, they start to come up. And the outskirts of the cities come up as where the lighter industry, manufacturing, starts to grow. And again, cities dominated by manufacturing like Geelong. Now move further into the knowledge economy, and what you see is that chart 
narrowing and narrowing and the bars getting taller and taller over our cities. So take the long view, if you animated this thing from the 19th century and went through the industrial age up into the knowledge age, you would see these charts gradually focusing, concentrating on the cities and getting taller and taller, just like the glass towers themselves, an allegory for that. More and more of our output, of our material living standards, is the result of what goes on in the big cities. Now, don't hear me say that therefore all the regional areas as were consigned to poverty. That isn't true. Relatively speaking, they have grown as well compared with their surrounding areas. But of course, they haven't grown as fast as the major cities have done. And even amongst the major cities, some have grown faster than others. The point is simply this. Place matters for our prosperity. Being close together matters. Well, why? because the very basis of our production is changing. We're moving rapidly towards the knowledge economy. And the knowledge economy is driven, ladies and gentlemen, by ideas. And ideas are things that are unique to us as sentient human beings. And what's more, we spark off each other when it comes to ideas. As the Bible says, people sharpen people as iron sharpens iron. That's exactly right. When we gather together, that's what you're here for. I mean, Dennis was telling me before, you'd done this conference for 10 years and, and maybe it was time to give it a rest. Well, there was just about a riot, Dennis tells me. The idea that you would no longer have this... Kind. Well, I mean, you, why don't you do this on the internet? Hey, what are you all doing here? Particularly when the train system is down and it's such a hassle to get here, right? I mean, just sign on on the internet, sit in the comfort of your own lounge room and participate. Yes, as if. Hey? Well, as if. OK? You want to be here, yes, for the community to catch up with people, your friends, people you know, people you respect, people you want to meet. Oh, that's true. But you want to be here primarily because of the stimulus. And it's not just what someone like me would say or other speakers giving you input. It's what you will now do with that as you go off for the rest of the conference. Right? You know, I didn't agree with what the guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And out of that will come the new ideas, the new initiatives, the new connections that will drive your organisations forward. You know that. I haven't got to tell you that. And, and it's not unique to community organisations. You're particularly fond of it because of your community orientation. But this could be a meeting full of um, bankers. Uh, I gave a similar talk to 100 executive directors of Macquarie Bank. Well, let me tell you, that's not the Sisters of Charity, right? OK? <laughs> But I had the same thing, with due respect to the sisters, right? It's the same thing. I mean, they could afford to do this entire conference from wherever they were around the world. So I said the same thing to them. How come you are all in Sydney? Here at the headquarters of Macquarie Bank here in Sydney. How come you're here and not doing this over the internet from wherever you are elsewhere in the world? It's the same answer. Of course we could do that. But that's not a conference. We want to be here to fix our colleagues eye to eye, to talk about the things that are exciting us, to argue with each other, to spark off each other, to generate new ideas and impetus, to go away feeling energised. Well, that's what it's about. I mean, microcosm that happens in a, in a conference like this, now widen the scale up and you start to see what happens in the modern city in the services sector, in the knowledge intensive part of the economy, where people sharpen people like iron sharpens iron. There is no, no coincidence uh, that my organisation, for example, one of the professional services firms, you know, intensive in the, in the knowledge economy, locates itself where the others are. Downtown Melbourne, that's where we have a deep pool of talent, that's where I can attract the people we need to attract, that's where our customers are, and that's where we encounter our colleagues and competitors and we sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. That's what drives our productivity. So the whole basis of economic production in this country is moving in this direction, which is making place more important, not less. Now, I won't go into the details today, but suffice to say, Australia has a productivity problem. Our living standards materially are beginning to stagnate. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, wages growth is basically flat. 
That is also part of the reason why prices have started to fall, at least in the last quarter, why revenue growth for companies is flat, and why the federal government has found itself out on a limb, having expected or promised to spend revenue which is not turned up. The revenue is not turned up for precisely the same reason. If wages aren't growing, people aren't paying, paying income taxes. If company profits aren't growing, companies aren't paying as much tax as the government expected. So it's all symptoms of the same thing. Uh, what do you do about that? You try to drive productivity growth. Why is this suddenly emerged? Because of the terms of trade. What's happening with China? China's changing its industrial situation and that's driven down our terms of trade as a result of which we're now back to doing things we need to do to grow our own living standards. We can't just rely on what the Chinese have been up to. Uh, and that comes back to productivity growth. Can we drive productivity growth? Are there policies to do that? Yes, that's how come I was involved with the competition policy review. Story for another day, but that's about growing our productivity. Just reorganizing the way we do things to make ourselves more productive. This, a story of place, is another part of the same thing. If we can make Australian places work, they will improve our productivity, drive our material living standards, enabling us, yeah, sure, to live better in a material way, but also to afford the things we want to afford to make life in this country fulfilling. So that we can spend money managing things like our great national parks, making sure that our hospitals and schools, our health services, that we can afford humane services like the NDIS, that we're a rich country, we can do those things. All of those things key off, in the end, productivity. The great American economist Paul Krugman says, productivity isn't everything, but in the end it's almost everything, and he's right. At least from the material side of things, and that matters for our material prosperity. So place is important because it's changing, but there's a tension here. The more we get together to spark off each other and generate this wealth through new ideas and the knowledge economy, at the same time, of course, the more we get in each other's way. There is a tension. These great cities, as they become bigger and more productive, also become more congested. And they can become, therefore, much less easy, unpleasant places to live in. Now, in the 19th century, we went through this as we moved through the Industrial Revolution and the cities became, in Blake's famous phrase, dark satanic mills. Well, people went there anyway. And the great migrations from the countryside to the city, they occurred notwithstanding the fact that the cities were full of smoke, they were dangerous places, they were filthy places, they were disease-risen places. People still went. Because notwithstanding all of that, the material opportunities that were available to them within these great industrial cities were still greater than what they were experiencing trying to eke out an existence in the countryside, particularly in a feudal system. If you're at the bottom, then your opportunities really lay going into the city, even though in the first instance, of course, that was a pretty miserable choice. Well, that was the 19th century. Here we are in the 21st century. And we have the same phenomenon. The cities are driving our prosperity. And it's still true that when we all gather in the one place, yes, we become more productive, but we also get in each other's way. We can drive each other to distraction. Now, the difference now is, however, this. In the 19th century, you sort of put up with it. Well, yep, one of these days, we make enough, we'll be able to sort the pollution out, we'll be able to improve the factory standards, we'll have the 1832 Reform Act, we'll do all that, but you just gotta give us some time to get this going. And broadly speaking, that's sort of what happened. Took a long time, but broadly speaking, that's what happened. In the knowledge economy, we can't do that. In the knowledge economy, if the people don't come, or if they come and they go, they don't stay, because there is no amenity, then you've just lost the basis of the economic productivity gain that you are hoping to realise. Productivity in the knowledge economy is driven by what economists call the economies of agglomeration. That is, all pulling together into a nice big blob. That is what grows our economic output. Yes, but if the blob doesn't agglomerate, if people don't come, 
or they drift away because this agglomeration is a hellish place to be involved in and there are better places to go. I don't need to be here. I can go to a smaller place where those same economies of agglomeration operate, maybe not quite as large, but they're still working, and the place has amenity. It's livable. It's human. I can live there. That choice people can exercise. So the great difference, folks, between the industrial economy is that in the industrial economy, if you like, disamenity, environmental disamenity, social disamenity, that was the flip side. It was the dark side of the growth in living standards that came through industrialization. But in the end, you could sort of ignore it. You just don't look at that side of the coin. It'll sort itself out over time. That won't happen this time. This time, these two things have to, have to travel together if they travel at all. Without amenity, environmental amenity, social amenity, commute, without these things that make places livable, the people won't come, or if they come, they won't stay. And if they don't come, or well, they don't stay. There is no agglomeration. And if there's no agglomeration, there is no productivity improvement in the knowledge economy. So you see, this time, we cannot ignore those dimensions of our communal life that make being in a place fulfilling for us as human beings. In the 19th century, we could focus on the material and park the other stuff which is partly why Blake wrote his famous poem, as the other romantics, protesting about this, protesting that there is more to human life than simply this. Well, we'll still have our poets making that point, and so they should. But at least this has changed. You're not running against the grain now. You're not running against the grain. This is where the message has come right back home for groups like yourselves. The community which you seek to build, the different dimensions of our common life which you seek to improve, right around this room, all the different pockets of our common life that are your mission, that are your calling, your life's work, these are things now which are part and parcel of what will grow our prosperity. For the first time, we can start to think about prosperity more broadly than just material prosperity. They travel together. And without one, you don't get the other. That is why this message is important for you to hear, but it's also an important message to give to business. You can't separate these things out anymore. You can't say, yeah, well, it doesn't matter the workers. No, 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 no. You have to look to the welfare of the workers and their community. Without that, they won't come or they won't stay. And if they don't, there goes the basis of your wealth creation in the professional services sector. So it's not because Deloitte, let me pick on my own colleagues, because Deloitte happens to be more soft-hearted than the others, that we have a whole lot of policies designed to make it easier for people to work for us. And we worry about their, you know, bringing their whole selves to work and the environment which they enjoy when they're there and all that sort of thing. Yeah, sure, we'd like to think we do have soft hearts. But actually, the hard head would lead you to precisely the same conclusion. Those two things now coming together. Well, in this paper, we've established what we regard as a 10-dimensional measure of prosperity to pick up the point I've just been making to you. One of those dimensions is material prosperity. That isn't going away. People still need jobs. They still need to eat and pay their bills. We're not changing any of that. But the message here is this that if you want to think about prosperity in the broad, not because it's a good, nice, gentle thing. To, no, no, no. This is a hard-headed way of thinking about this problem. You need to think about prosperity more broadly than just material. You need to think about health. You need to think about local amenities. You need to think about environmental amenity. You need to think about the sorts of things that make people work together productively. Ideas, take risks, show initiative. So we've set up a 10-dimensional productivity measure. And then, broadly speaking, we show that you, know, you take the ingredients, the good old ingredients of people and tools and land. You add these boosters that are, in many respects, social, that make people work together well and productively. 
that encourage risk-taking and entrepreneurship that build social capital. And out the other end there, you're going to get some progress on one or more of these 10 dimensions. Then what we do is to think about place. And we divide Australia up into five broad regions. Now you can use all sorts of different measures to categorize place. This is just one of them. So we're not saying this is the only way you could do this. Maybe you have a different set of places. But this is what we do in this paper. We distinguish inner cities from suburbs, outer urban areas from regional areas and regional cities, and finally rural and remote Australia. We divide Australia up into those five regions. Then what you see on these charts, it might not be clear here looking at it now, but if you're interested you follow it up on the internet or we can get a copy of the paper uh, itself if you're interested. These 10 dimensional charts or radar charts, we call them spider charts. And what you can see there is that you take these individual regions and using ABS data, we try to plot where we think each of these regions is at the moment, just on those dimensions. So around the outside of the diagram are all of those 10 dimensions. And the further out you are towards the edge of the chart, the higher ranked you are on different dimensions. And the closer into the centre, the lower ranked you are. Now, I don't want to get into the science and the detail. I just want you to look at the pattern. I want you to observe one thing. And that is that each of the regions of our country, whether you're inner city, suburb, outer urban, regional, or rural and remote, Notice that each of these regions firstly has a different pattern of inputs, what we call boosters, and outputs. So it's a different mix. And they have strengths and weaknesses. Our contention is that any of these places, so, so, so my story is not a story about everybody coming to live in the centre of Melbourne or the centre of Sydney. That, that is not my story at all. It might be more productive, but it'll just add enormously to congestion. Two sides of this coin. My story is, whichever place you happen to be, or whichever place you're thinking you'd like to make more prosperous on these 10 dimensions, how might you do that? Where would you start? Well, firstly, you need to draw a chart like this. What have we got? What are our strengths? And what are our relative weaknesses? And how could we, in how could we potentially produce flourishing, a flourishing place where we were right out on the edge of all of those 10 dimensions? How could we produce that? And how could we avoid its opposite, languishing on the other side of the diagram there where everything shrinks into the center? Now that's just saying, how could we go from there, for example, to a flourishing place? rather than a languishing place? How can we make sure that the strengths that we already have continue to grow? How can we make sure the weaknesses that we have in whatever region we happen to be can be strengthened? Now, let me add one little further piece. This process is dynamic, which means to say if you just decide to sit and watch and do nothing, then the world doesn't stay the same. Uh, you never step into the same river twice, as they say. This is a dynamic process. So if you want to go from where you are in the direction of flourishing and avoid the direction of languishing, you have to do something. You may be fortunate and the place would flourish by itself, but it's not that likely. What is more likely is that it would languish depending upon where you are. You need to be active about this. What are the forces that drive a place in the direction of flourishing and away from languishing. In the paper, we talk about four of them, and there you are on this list. People. This is a knowledge economy. Without people, there are no ideas. There is no innovation. There is no basis of growth. You have to have people. So population growth, bringing people here to your place, is an important ingredient, essential. And people can't just come to be individuals. They will come if they can be part of community. 
That's important for them. It fulfills dimensions of their lives. I'm, I'm not going to preach to you about that. that. You know that. But it's on this list. And technology. I rubbish technology before saying, well, it's suggesting that we can just do away with distance and that's not true. Yeah, true. But technology can also help us to live together in larger agglomerations without tripping over each other. It can actually help to make large agglomerations of people work. Whether it's things like uh, you know, the Yarra Trams application, tram app, so you know when your tram is, or you train the PTV apps that help you to use the, the public transport system more effectively, or whether it's using technology like I did this morning to get my little car share from Fitzroy North and come across here in a car share thing, discovered at quarter past eight that my wife needed the car, oh dear. Huh? Within five minutes on my app, I have booked my little nearest go-get car, which is the end of my street, and brought myself here in the go-get car. Technology facilitates that. That whole booking process done within 40 seconds. Bang, bang, bang. And if that car hadn't been available, then another half a dozen around where I live. Technology helps us to live together, keeping, you know, in that instance, my, my car, I guess, is on the road, but potentially keeping other cars off the road. I don't have two. I can use a community car. And finally, governance, which is a fancy word for how we reconcile the age-old tension between individual preferences and community preferences. The things we want to do as individuals and the things we need to do as a group. Governance is the set of rules and arrangements which try to help us to resolve that tension. Very important. And as we face another federal election, we see this machinery grinding up at its national level, the national expression of this. We have to keep that machinery well oiled in order for us to live together harmoniously. Governance matters. They're the four dynamic forces that we argue in this paper can drive flourishing and avoid languishing, and community is in there. So I said you need to take action. What can you potentially do? Who is it who can act? Well, the nice thing about this story is that, frankly, you can help to build place by acting across any of these four quarters here. Individuals can help to build place just by their own actions. I suppose the most famous example of that, and we cite it in the report, uh, is Mr. Walsh, David Walsh, uh, who famously, of course, donated a lot of money to build the Mona. Uh, in Hobart. You might think, oh, that's a nice, you know, contemporary art, modern art museum. Yes, but that has become the backbone of tourism in Tasmania. You would be amazed, right, at the value of that to Tasmania and to the Tasmanian community. One person's vision. Yes, a wealthy man. Yes, you know, maybe you've got some difficulties with some of the, where the money comes from. Well, well yeah, yeah but, but the reality is one person had a vision and that changed the nature of a place. Communities can do that. You know that. Communities, let's take a little example we cite in, in, the, in the report uh, of uh, Clunes, little old gold mining town, like a lot of gold mining towns, not looking, you know, too prosperous. And some community decides that they're going to set up a book festival there, which has now become a national event. And not every community succeeds in that way, but there is an example where community has changed the whole trajectory of a place. Governments get place. You haven't got to convince governments of the importance of place. They understand that. Uh, the rejuvenation of Geelong with the demise of the motor vehicle industry is something that governments have assisted enormously with by making strategic investments in place to try to create a new future for a place. You haven't got to convince government. Of all of those four there, ladies and gentlemen, you do not need to convince three of them of the logic of what I've been talking to you about this morning. But the one you do need to convince is business. Because what business will typically say is this, yeah, we understand all this, but, you know, if the government built a freeway, if the government built an airport, if the government put a university here, if the government put a hospital, if the government, if the government, if the government, if the government, we would stay. If not, we will go. And the whole message of this report boiled down into one sentence is this, not so fast. Because the basis of your profit growth, the basis of your prosperity, is in this place, is in making this virtuous circle of flourishing work. And you, by shifting place, 
could just be cutting off your nose to spite your face. You want to talk to me about where the future returns will come from, about how I can avoid staring down the barrel of low returns to my investment as far as the eye can see, then here is my answer, my friend. The basis of productivity growth will be making places work. And you, as a business, have as much to gain from helping that virtuous circle to be catalyzed into growth as anybody else does. So when the community groups come and talk to you about community, the individual comes up with his or her fancy idea about how to rejuvenate this place, or the government decides that it's going to put some investment in, you just don't sit, I'm talking to business, you just don't sit there passively and say, well, I'll see. If it looks like it's working, I might stay, otherwise I will go. Wrong. This will work if there is collaboration amongst these four groups. And yes, Mr. Business Person, if no one else is stumping up, maybe it needs to be you. And maybe you need to go along to the local community groups or to the government or individuals even and suggest ways in which we can work together to fire up this collaborative process of flourishing. So this is a challenge to business to think differently about how place builds prosperity, to think differently about how collaboration can be catalyzed towards that end. Now again, I don't expect any person in this room to be bowled over by that insight, to sort of say at some cynical level, we've always known that, this is not news to us. I know it's not news to you, but it is news to business. And furthermore, when you interact with business, Maybe you already do this, I'd be delighted if you do, but you don't, you know, you've got to change the clothes. Business will see you coming in to ask them for more corporate social responsibility commitment. Well, I mean, it's a good thing to do CSR, right? And that's important, yes, yeah. But you don't want to be seen in that light. I'm not here to ask for your charity. I'm here to ask for your collaborative engagement to build our collective prosperity, including yours, including your shell and your stakeholders, because our prosperity is linked together in ways that have never been true as strong as they are today. Never been wholly true that community didn't matter, but it's much more important now than it has done before. So folks, my message to you this morning is that as a community group, as communities in control, that's not just a phrase that Dennis and Maureen dreamt up, that is actually true. Communities you are in control are not just of the groups that you happen to represent. You have a role to play here, which is almost unprecedented, in helping to, to um, catalyze a collaborative process which produces flourishing, ideally, across all those ten dimensions. That's where you now come in. And it's a message to be taken off to business. Governments get the message, but you can tell them too. Goes off to business to say to business, you know, times have changed. You ought to get with the program. There's a whole new way of thinking about what builds material prosperity, i.e. revenues and shareholder returns. And that actually involves collaboration across these four groups to make places work. And so we've not come here today to ask for your charity. We've come here today for ask, to ask for your co-investment in a collaborative effort to build the prosperity of place. And if we succeed in doing that, then we will catalyze flourishing and not languishing across 10 dimensions of prosperity. And we can genuinely look forward to leaving a better place for those who come after us. Thank you very much.